Joanne and I are very pleased and honored to be bringing this program to you. It was quite a challenge, even though most of his designs had been saved. There never was an address on the design. So finding some of the lesser known buildings and homes was quite a challenge. Early on, discovered that we had way too much for one program to cover the Longchamp and his work. So we have chosen today to do Reno, Sparks, and UNR. So Zoanne did sneak in a couple of her favorite pictures, which is okay. We are very sorry that an oral history was never done on him. It would answer a lot of the questions that we have. Here is an often used picture of Mr. de Longchamp. Because I had some French in school and he came from Montreal, I tend to pronounce his name the way a Canadian might. He was born in Reno, passed away in a rest home in 1969. He's buried in the Masonic portion of Mount View Cemetery, along with his first wife, Rosemary, one of his sisters, Georgina, and his adopted son, Galen's son, also named Galen. It's a very simple gravesite for them. Not what you'd expect for someone who made such an imprint on Nevada architecture. This is the home his father built for his family on Mill Street around 1896 when they had moved here. The building uh, was one on a large piece of property, which they sold off bit by bit over the years. When I first started researching this, oh, 20 some years ago, there was another building to the northwest of their home. And I suspect that's where Mr. De Longchamp lived when he was an adult, not married and working. Let's look at the family. The parents were Feliz, called Felix, and Exilda Dubois of Canada. I do not know if they knew each other in Canada or if they met in Carson City. You see his siblings. The oldest child was a girl, married Mrs. Mr. Donahue, and ended up uh, as an adult in L.A. Then came Agnes Longchamp as Dunn, who uh, lived in Butte, Montana, and visited back and forth with her mother after her marriage. Then came Georgina de Longchamp first, the one who is buried next to Mr. D in the cemetery. Then the fifth child was Philip W. de Longchamp. His parents were married in Carson City in 1879, moved to Reno, where he worked as a carpenter, building bridges, homes, other buildings. He died in 1926. When Felix entered the U.S., he could only speak French. So either at the border with the papers done there or with his job here in Nevada, his name was spelled de Longchamp, C-H-A-N-T. And it was that way for several years until the two families got together again. And the Canadians said, why are you spelling your name so funny? So you will see on early papers and the plaque on the post office, if it's still there, spells the long shot, C-H-A-N-T. But soon Mr. D changed it to the old spelling. The youngest child, Philip W. de Longchamp, married Mary Grace Knowlton. They had one child, Philip Mayhew de Longchamp, born in 1909. Philip M. became an architect, having gone through college, and worked in Sacramento, California, but died of pneumonia there at the age of 38. He had worked a while with his grandfather right out of college, and according to the Reno Gazette Journal, uh, he was moving from Sacramento to Reno again when he died. Mr. D. married Elizabeth Shea of Virginia City in 1907, and they had one son, Frederick Vincent, born 1908. He attended uh, Reno schools and graduated from UNR, went into the Merchant Marines, and he was there from 1938 until his death from pneumonia in 1953, somewhere on the West Coast. We found no mention of a marriage or children. Elizabeth died in 1924. In 1926, he married Rosemary Kamek of Iowa, who had been widowed but lived in Reno. She had one son, Galen, who was adopted by and given his name, something that has come as quite a surprise to those of us who didn't live here in the 30s or 40s or who have researched 
Mella Harmon wrote me, I think about two months ago, and said she had run across something in official documents. While I found an article that said he and Rosemary, Rosemary had so sued him for divorce. She was still his wife when he died. So I figured it was dropped, but it wasn't. According to what Webmella found, they were divorced in August of 1932. Pay attention to these dates. He married Mrs. Thelma Robinson in Minden in December of 1932. Then they were divorced in Holmesby County, Carson City, on August 10th, 1933. On August 19th, 1933, Mr. D and Rosemary were remarried and they stayed married until his death. Galen Rosemary's son married Joanne Cutton in 1941 and they had a son Galen the Longchamp Jr. called Dare, who unfortunately committed suicide as a young adult. Joanne de Longchamp had a long career as a poet and writer and was connected to UNR. I don't think she was a, an official professor there, but I think she gave talks for various classes, mostly on poetry. Her home was in the area just south of the campus, and she donated it to the university. It has been moved to Taylor and Nixon. She died in 1983 of cancer. Now his early years, you know, when he was born, he graduated from Reno High, but had already shown quite a propensity for art and design. After he received his mining engineering degree, he went to work in an Inyo County mine as an assistant. As such, he was down in the mines all the time and developed a lung problem. His doctor said, get out of the mines. So he came back to Reno and uh, became to work with U.S. surveyors. After the great earthquake of 1906, he went up to San Francisco and worked for a good year, if not a year and a half. He returned to Reno in late 1907. He set up a partnership in architecture with Ira Tesh, with whom he had worked in this U.S. surveyor's office. They lasted um, almost two years until Mr. Tesh was called to Colorado for a family emergency and didn't return. So he was on his own after uh, 1909. Let's begin to look at his designs that Zoanne and I have chosen to use. You will see NRHP alongside each building or home that is on the National Register of Historic Places. When people say, oh, I just moved here. I never heard of Longchamp. I say, have you ever been to the bridge on Virginia Street? Well, yeah. I said, okay. And then I would point out these three. The original county courthouse was a red brick rectangular building facing Virginia Street with three white columns. By the early 1900s, Washoe County had outgrown it and needed a bigger one, but they had the land, so they wanted the original one enlarged. Take off the roof, of course. They had um, a contest, so to speak, and Mr. DeRongchamp scored the work. Uh, there's no uh, mention of how many people applied, however. This is a neoclassical revival building. Revival means they reached back decades or centuries to a certain style that was used, maybe Greek, Roman, Chinese, whatever. But that's what revival means. One day after this had been built, I was in a small group standing on the second floor, and uh, a lady judge came by and unlocked courtroom number one. And I said to her, can one see any of the original bricks? And she said, yes, I'll show you. We went into the courtroom and then down a hall, she opened a closet and there you could touch the original under the some years old. There was an all day session for tour leaders. And when we got to the courthouse, we were standing between the courthouse and the riverside and Paul Ferrari, who had been one of those working on the courthouse was talking to us. And he said they were able to save the courthouse by using a sky hook. Of course, we all giggled, but he got us up on the roof. What an opportunity. And here is this huge I-beam going from the front of the courthouse to the back, the smaller ones crossing every few yards. Then they had run rebar down the walls and attached them at the top. And that's how they shored it up for earthquakes. If you go to the corner of 
Liberty and Virginia Street and look at the courthouse. You can see the top edge of the I-beam. Isn't that amazing? Okay, the Riverside. The Riverside Hotel had begun in the 1800s as a wood structure by a wooden bridge crossing the Truckee. The hotel burned down and another one was built. Years later, it burned down. In 1924, George Wingfield acquired the property and hired Mr. D to design a hotel for him. And this is what you see. It's a period revival building. More of the top part of it has a Gothic style influence. After earthquakes struck the Reno area, I think in the 70s, it was thought that the Riverside would have to come down. However, considering the year Mr. D spent in San Francisco with other architects designing buildings that were, you could say, earthquake proof, he applied that when, when doing the Riverside. The Riverside main support are huge round cement pillars going all the way up and down. They had rebar all around the edges. Rebar is that very heavy black metal, doesn't bend easily. But in addition, he took rebar from the bottom to the top and curved it around the outside edge, meeting up with the vertical rebars. Every place they met, there was a real strong soldering. And that whole thing kept it from crumbling. In the early 2000s, the owners at that time had become Sierra Arts Foundation. And they partnered up with a company from Minneapolis called Artspace, whose job, whose function was to pair with such companies as Sierra Arts and restore buildings, especially historic ones. And they did a fine job. The rooms are now apartments for artists. And the artists might be starving, but they can't be rich. They have to show um, tax returns and so on. There is a gallery downstairs to display their art. And there's an office space for Sierra Art. And of course, as you know, towards the river, there is a restaurant. The post office, although standard building plans had been developed for post offices, commissioned architects were allowed, when feasible, to give individual treatment to the exterior details. And Mr. D achieved this in spades. The outer exterior is pale green terracotta trimmed to resemble quarried stone. Now, the green is very pale. You can see it when the light is right, but it doesn't hit you between the eyes. The aluminum panels over the doors represent transportation and an old Indian motif is used for decoration inside and out. Remember, this was done in 1931, 32, 33, before World War II, and the Nazis co-opted the old Indian motif. Now let's look at some of the buildings in Sparks. He did homes in Sparks too, but we've just chosen these most obvious ones. On the left, you see the Washoe County Library, beautiful building. Now the Sparks Heritage Museum, is a small but very good museum downstairs and a nice large meeting room upstairs. This is a great example of the Spanish colonial revival style. On the right is the Sparks Catholic Church. Then it became home of the Immaculate Conception Church for many years. They outgrew it, sold it to another church who used it and then sold it to another church who sold it to a developer who is in the process of applying to tear it down. This is another example of the Spanish colonial revival style. On Prater Way is the Robert Mitchell School. This is an old picture, but it looks the same. Trees aren't much bigger, but it's still being used as a school. Then we have the Mary Lee Nichols School, which is on the corner of 8th and D. Well, now it's Pyramid Way and D. It's the home of windy moon quilts now excellent condition. And finally, one of my favorites, the beautiful Sparks High School building. It was at C and 15th Street. It's gone now. It was a high school until uh, 1951 or 52 when a new high school was built, and then it was used for a junior high. This shows the Beaux-Arts influence. We should also mention that he designed the Kate Smith School on 19th Street in 1924. Lastly, in Sparks, we have chosen the administration building that he designed. And at that time, it was called the Insane Asylum on Asylum Road. The campus became the Nevada State Hospital. 
This is the administration building. And he also designed a men's war building for the campus, but that's been demolished. On the right, you see how there's been an addition. Hits at right angles. The addition is on the left and covers most of the front elevation. It's still being used today, however, but sure was beautiful. Okay, and we're going to take a quick break from his designs to talk about uh, his partnerships as an architect. As we had mentioned before, he partnered with Ira Tesh from 1907 to 1909. That was a, a brief professional association before Mr. Tesh had to move away. And then he practiced alone from 1909 until 1936. In 1936, he partnered with George O'Brien, and they established the firm of DeLongchamp and O'Brien. And Mr. O'Brien was from San Francisco. He was a California certified architect who began working with Mr. DeLongchamp around 1916. So they would collaborate, but they weren't official partners. He was quoted as saying that he'd occasionally come to Reno to work with Mr. D when Mr. DeLongchamp had a little too much work. As I mentioned, they became partners later in 1936. Mr. O'Brien had a really good head for business, which suited Mr. D, who could then concentrate on the more creative aspects of his work. In 1962, Hewitt Wells joined the firm as a partner, and he would go on to design the Washoe County Library downtown, as well as City Hall, which is now the Discovery Museum. In 1965, uh, DeLongchamp and O'Brien both retired. And then in 1978, Mr. Wells sold the drawings from their firm to the Special Collections Department of UNR for $5,000. So thanks to him, we have the whole DeLongchamp uh, architectural drawing collection. So up at UNR, Mr. DeLongchamp designed several buildings. The whole historic part of campus is on the National Register. First here on the left is the standalone library he designed. Before this building was built, the college's library had been um, inside other buildings. It didn't have an actual building of its own. It is now called the Jones Center. The university has been through a couple of libraries since then. And it's a very simple and elegant design with the accentuated entry, some classical revival accents in there. And then on the right, we have the old gymnasium. Um, its actual construction was delayed while waiting for matching government funds. And then there was another delay because of the war. It was initially designed in 1938. It's a symmetrical brick building, rectangular, and it has decorative elements of the art modern style. And this is the only building of this style on the campus. Uh, it was used for volleyball for years, but now it contains complete training facilities and renovated locker rooms. It was designed in 1938, but then it was not completed until uh, 1945. And then in 1919, he designed the College of Education building, and this was opened as the Teachers Training College, and the building served as UNR's education building for nearly 50 years before it transitioned to the Thompson Student Services building, uh, which was named for Reuben C. Thompson, who is a faculty member and later a College of Education dean. Uh, the Thompson building now houses the College of Liberal Arts Advising Center, Department of Political Science, Core Humanities, and it was recently renovated as well. And then on the right here is the chemistry building, now called the science building. These are both Loveloop designs. Uh, you can see they're very similar. They both reflect the neoclassical revival style, which was very popular throughout college campuses during this time. The Nevada State Mining Experiment Station was built in 1920. It's still in use today. And it is located immediately north of the Mackey School of Mines. And then on the right, we see a picture of his U.S. Bureau of Mines building. This was designed a little bit later, um, 1952, 1953. And you can see it's definitely a more contemporary design. He also did some designs for a UNR bunkhouse in 1919, a men's dorm in 1947, and some other small buildings throughout the campus over the years. We also have several designs to show you, not on the UNR campus, but in the city of Reno. And the first is the Nixon National Bank, designed by George Nixon, who by that time owned several banks in Nevada. It later became the Reno National Bank. 
It's not a bank now. It was part of Paris until that property sold last year, but it still is right there on the corner of uh, 2nd and Virginia Street. It's arguably one of Reno's most beautiful buildings. There's not another building in town like it. And interestingly, after Senator Nixon's death, Mr. DeLongchamp also designed uh, his mausoleum, which is pictured here on the right. It's in the Masonic portion of Mountain View Cemetery. Um, and you might notice the red coloring coming up the stairs and the columns. That is from the minerals in the sprinkler system water. So it's not an intentional part of the design, um, but it does look, the building looks very interesting. Here on the left, we have a shot of an early day Reno Fire Department building, uh, which was located on South Virginia Street. This is one of very few DeLongchamp designs that reflects the craftsman style. And then on the right, we have the very popular Lawton Hot Springs School and Bathhouse, uh, which has a real resort feel uh, with its Spanish tiled roofs and also with the tower. Of course, it suffered when I-80 was built, which ultimately bypassed the complex. In uh, 1910, Mr. DeLongchamp designed the Nevada, California, Oregon Depot building. Um, pictured here on the left, and it has recently been renovated into the depot, restaurant, and brewery distillery. The style is really a nod to the Mediterranean revival with its tiled roof, the large paired brackets below the roof line, um, the coins along the corner, and then of course the large arched opening. Um, it's beautiful both inside and out. They've done an excellent um, rehabilitation on that building. And then on the right is the Alpine Glass Company. It's almost directly across 4th Street from the depot. Um, and he, Mr. DeLongchamp designed the portion of the building seen here. Uh, there are a couple different sections of the building. And then we have the Osten Motor Company building. In 1915, the California-based Osten McFarland Auto Company opened a Reno branch, and they exclusively offered Mitchell cars, but it was its second brand, Dodge Brothers, which sent its sales upward. Uh, the company had operated a showroom and a repair shop in downtown Reno on Commercial Row for eight years um, before actually moving here. George Osen moved from the Bay Area to Reno to manage the company his father had co-founded, prompting its name change to Osen Motor Sales. Uh, you can see it is a beautiful building. It has an exterior surface that features both raised and recessed brick and rows of brick laid in horizontal decorative patterns. There are terracotta medallions um, that you can see all along up here. And then there are emblems inside these medallions, which resemble a Jewish Star of David. Um, and they are formed with two interlocking triangles with the interlocked letters B and B, which stands for Dodge Brothers. And the emblem served as the company's logo uh, through the late 1920s, but you can still clearly see the emblems on the building today, even though the brick has been all painted red. So it looks a little different than it did originally. Uh, Mr. Osen died in 1944, and Philip Dietz then bought the company. And then in the early 1930s, St. Thomas Aquinas hired Mr. DeLongchamp to build them a parish house and a school to accompany the cathedral downtown. Uh, these are both Spanish revival designs. I noticed the red tile roof. The school is fairly simple. It's symmetrical. And the most detail it has is this intricate cast concrete uh, door surround. The parish house, on the other hand, here on the right, is asymmetrical with more understated details. So we see two different expressions of that Spanish revival style. And the buildings are arranged on either side of the main cathedral, which fronts onto Second Street. We also have the Washoe County General Hospital, later known as Washoe Med, now renowned on Mill Street. Uh, this was designed in the Art Deco style. Um, it's brick with stylized terracotta ornamentation and decorative brickwork. Uh, originally, it was mostly administrative offices. It's not really the part of the building that you tend to see from the street. A lot has been built up around it. 
And then we also have the Vakina apartment. Here on the right, this building has a classical revival influence. Uh, it's built with concrete blocks. And then you have the entrance portico with double Tuscan columns. They were pretty much all one bedroom apartments. And when the building was new, it featured French doors to the hallway and also uh, Murphy pull down beds in each unit. Here we have a couple of houses as we move into Old Southwest Reno. The Joseph Giraud and Roy Hardy house is on the left. We believe it's both polite and correct to refer to these two important homes by the original owner's name and also the more famous owner's name. So the Giraud Hardy house, he designed for sheetman Joseph Giraud in the colonial revival style. Mr. Giraud was also referred to as a stockman. And the family lived here from 1914 until about 1929, when we believe that the bank may have taken the house back um, due to the stock market crash and the ensuing depression. Uh, Roy, Roy Hardy then bought the house in 1936 or 1937, and the family owned it until the mid-70s when the new owner made it into a restaurant uh, called the Hardy House. In 2005, the E.L. Cord Foundation acquired it, and it became an art gallery with Italian work. For years, a few times a year, an Italian chef would come and give uh, cooking classes in the kitchen, which had been enlarged. And then on the right, we have the uh, Lewis Gibbons Patrick McCarran House. And this was built for Lewis Gibbons in 1913-1914. Lewis Gibbons was part of the Hoyton Gibbons and later the Gibbons, French, and Stoddard law firms. Uh, he was a political figure of importance and influence in both uh, Reno and Tonopah. And he lived in this house until his death, after which Patrick McCarran bought it from his widow in 1921. And Patrick McCarran is very well known. He was a U.S. Senator from Nevada between 1932 and 1932. Before, but he only lived in this house for a couple of years. Interestingly enough, uh, Mr. McCarran did represent George Wingfield's estranged wife in a divorce proceeding. So just a little Reno divorce trivia there. And then we have uh, Mr. DeLongchamp's own home, which is located on Elm Court. This was built in 1919. It's only 1,200 square feet. And it sits on a property that's a little over 2,500 square feet. So the house takes up a lot of the property. It is clad with stone and is of random ashlars. Ashlars are these square cut rock blocks, essentially. Um, but instead of being laid out in straight rows or courses, they're laid randomly throughout the wall. Um, it also has a prominent arched front doorway and an eyebrow-styled roof line over the second-story balcony, which you can see the curves right there. Inside, there's a stone fireplace, and the kitchen, <clears throat> living room, and dining room are all on the first floor, and the second floor is entirely comprised of the bedroom. So this is just a one-bedroom house. The garage next door has been converted into a two-room studio. You can kind of see the edge of it over here. And it was converted, of course, by later owners. We are told that Mr. DeLongchamp married his second wife, Elizabeth, in this cottage. Here on the left, we have the home for John and Ada Williams. Uh, it is now a law office, and it has a rubble stone foundation, which you can barely see the corner of in this photograph. But it's, it's a kind of foundation that we see that was used very often um, during the 20s and 30s in Reno. Uh, there's also a nice bay window in the front with multi-paned windows. There's a stone entrance over on the left-hand side, which you also can't really see from the photo. And there's a stone archway with a keystone. I'm sure a lot of you drive by this house every day. It's right on the corner of Ridge Street in Arlington. So you can always check out that entrance for yourself. Uh, the Williamses lived here for only about six or seven years. And Mr. DeLongchamp did some other designs for Mr. Williams, although we haven't actually been able to prove if they were built and if they were where they are located. By 1937, Noble and Louise Getchell were living in this house. And the Getchell name might sound familiar, 
Uh, he was the owner of the Getchell Mines, and he also donated money to UNR to help build the library that bore his name, uh, which no longer exists. Now it has a very appreciative owner, a lawyer, who has his office here, and he just absolutely loves being in this building. Okay, on the right, we have the Albert R. DaCosta home. He lived here for about 14 years, and it was originally one story with a basement. And you can see that the exterior was built with the more expensive lighter color brick, not the red brick. And that's because uh, Reno's soil does not uh, have the qualities that produce light brick. It can only produce red brick. So it had to be brought in from out of the area. Notice the arched entrance with the keystone pattern in the front. And um, you can't see it, but uh, later on, a second story was added in the back. The owner, Dr. DaCosta, was from Illinois. He was a physician and a surgeon and had his office on 2nd Street. We find him in 1944 in the city directory, listed as a Reno health officer and physician. Of course, owner, other owners and renters came along. And then from 1965 to the 80s, another physician, Tom Mullis, was here and later had his office here as well. He may have been the one who had the second story added. And since the 1990s, it's largely been home to attorneys. On the left, we have the home built for Harry and Ann Ginsburg. Mm -hmm. Mr. Ginsburg was a successful jeweler and an executive with Reno Furniture Company. This is period revival Tudor. Uh, you can see from the tall pointed roof uh, brick with half timbering above. Those are indications of Tudor style. Inside, the doorways had curved tops, made it a little more attractive. The fireplace was built in, as were most of the houses that Mr. D designed. The current owner was delighted that it hadn't been changed much, nor did he do anything structurally different to it, though he did remove the very large bushes that were along the front walk, so we now can enjoy the architecture very much. On the right is the Frank Margrave Jr. home. A newspaper clipping said that he sold his mine, Nevada Packard mine, outside of Lovelock and moved his family here. However, in the city directories for the next couple of years, he's listed as owning that mine, so maybe he only sold part of it. He also purchased area around town, including the Kitsky Ranch, later turned it into a turkey farm. In 1945, he is reported to have had 10,000 turkeys on that farm. What a noise. Due to the rise in feed costs, he sold it and then had the land subdivided for housing. On the left is the home he designed for Edward and Clara Chisholm. Edward Chisholm was of the Chisholm Dairy and Ice Cream Company, which was founded in 1901 and was on West 4th Street. The semicircular arched entrance, which is hidden by the bushes on the right, has a balcony above it, which is accessed by one of the bedrooms. One can sit there with a couple of chairs and enjoy the neighborhood, which the owners, current owners do. The house style is period revival Tudor. The brick and half timbering, steeply gabled roofs, brick chimneys, more than one, all indicate the Tudor. And the Chisholm lived here from 29 for many years. On the right is the Benham Fleischer home named for two important owners. Gary Benham was a banker, I believe, and on the board of directors of the Union Federal Bank. His wife was a sister to Mrs. Chisholm, so when I would lead the walk going down here, I would call these the sister homes. This home, too, is Tudor in style. It seems that the original plans called for a larger home than what was built, probably due to the Depression. Later, Richard Fleischer, who had grown up in Reno, married and he and his wife moved back to Reno and he wanted to be in the Newlands neighborhood and they found this house. When they went to do remodeling a couple of years later, and he, he bought it about 25 years ago, when they went to do remodeling, they went through the entire house and up in the attic, they found the Longchamp original designs for the house. What are the chances of that happening? What a gold mine. 
When the remodeling was done, they used that design, so the house ended up looking exactly as it was originally designed. In the hallway was a sketch that the Longchamp made of the house, an oil painting of the house when they bought it, and a copy of the sketch used in the Home for the Holidays booklet. It was on the home tour that year. Their 1100 square foot edition won the first City of Reno Historic Preservation Commission Award in 1990. Fleischer's has since sold it to someone else. This is the home built design for Floris Eccles. The Eccles family founded Reno Grocer Company and Reno Furniture Company. This is a Mediterranean or Spanish eclectic design. Eclectic means it's that design of that era, but with couple little changes. It is essentially a rectangular building with a seven-sided bay. If you take the time to count, you'll see there's seven sides. I have not been inside. I wish I had. When I first saw it, there were lots of trees and bushes all around it. But after a redo, whether it was restuccoed or repainted, the owners put in lower vegetation. On the right is the Albert Denals home. Albert was president of Denals and Steinmetz Inc., a store for furniture, carpets, drapes, etc. It's American Foursquare with a painted brick exterior beige. Now, American Foursquare means there are four rooms downstairs and four upstairs, counting the bedroom and the kitchen. The door does not have to be in the center. Indeed, here it is off center. The other original portion was the portico, only in the front. The part on the left, which was to the east, was added later, and an extension was added later also. The inside is particularly beautiful. I would like to have put in some pictures, but we don't have time. The Joseph Barash home, very interesting. It has a center hall plan. Classical inferences, influences are seen in the door surround and windows. The French eclectic influence includes the dormer windows, which interrupt the cornice line and really makes the house more interesting. On the right, we have the William Curtis home that he designed um, very close to Newland Circle. It's a period revival, asymmetrical, with canted rectangular bay window and steep roof line. Canted means the bay window roof is not 90% this way and this way. It slants. On the left, we have the W.B. Mickles home on Marsh and Newland Circle. And this was the best picture I could get without trespassing on the property. This is a period revival. Again, it's English, two-story, irregular plan, brick exterior, half-timbered over on the left on the second story, has steep roofs, keystone. But interesting, the keystone itself is of a different color. You don't see that very often. They all hint at the Tudor style. On the right, we call it the Sydney and Janet Morrison home. It was first addressed at 850 Joaquin Miller. I say that we think it was because Dr. Morrison, the year this was built, was shown as living at one Elm Court, which was the house that uh, Mr. Newlands built to do his business work from. And from 1941 on, it shows E.P. Caffrey living here, sometimes owning it, sometimes not. But later years in the directories, he's listed as being a technologist at the hospital that Dr. Morrison was connected to. I could find no obituary that connected the two as being relatives. So maybe they were just co-workers. Now, one of my favorite ones is coming up next. I just love these houses. These are two of the four spec homes we believe he designed for a Florida firm called the Home Builders. There are two more homes on Nixon. These were built here, but the company was in Florida. One design doesn't have Home Builders on it, but it has Florida. We believe that he designed these spec homes to help architects in Florida after a devastating hurricane. Again, the oral history would have helped us learn why he did that. They are one story originally, Mediterranean or Spanish eclectic style houses with stucco exterior and red tile roof. You see the kind of details on the houses, like rounded arches supported by twisted columns or piers, a parapet, the house on the right has a parapet. 
small balconies, uh, wrought iron little doors, window grills, low relief carvings. The uh, homes on Marsh have been remodeled, but still retain much of the original style. The second story, I believe, was added later. An interesting side note is the owners of 585 were for many years the owners of what we call the shingle house when you did the bricks and stones walk. By coincidence, their daughter owned another renovated historic home on that same walk, a block or two north of the shingle house. Here we have a whole slide dedicated to the John Wanamaker Jr. home, uh, later known as the Mates home. So I'm sure this is one a lot of you have driven by it's right on Arlington and Mount Rose. It's Tudor style, two story and constructed out of frame and brick masonry. You also see some stone masonry, some stucco. There's a little bit of everything. And it has a steeply pitched roof. There's half timbering on the second story. Of course, probably the most prominent feature is that tower with a conical roof. And the Wanamakers were a well-to-do family on the East Coast. And John Jr. came here for a divorce, like many other East Coasters. And also at the time, the tax laws were very lax in Nevada which was a great advantage to an enterprising man like Mr. Wanamaker. So he commissioned Mr. DeLongchamp to design this home, which in later years was owned by uh, the Mates family. And this is another house that's often referred to as just with the famous family's name. So often it's just referred to as the Mates name, but the Wanamakers were here first. On the left here, we have the Harold Brown home. This is another period revival, uh, English country style house one and a half stories. And this is in the Old Northwest. It faces south towards Whitaker Park, which is right across the street. And you can see a couple of similarities between this and his own home on Elm Court, uh, notably the eyebrow roof line, except of course, this is all brick versus that uh, very romantic stone ashlar. And then on the right, we have Mrs. Ryan's home. And this is actually at right angles to the Brown home. So it's right around the corner and it faces east onto Whitaker Park. And this is a really good example of Mr. DeLongchamp designing small homes as well as mansions. This is a modest Cape Cod influenced house. Here on the left, we have um, the home that was designed for Catherine McCampbell on Urban and Plumas. This was on the Hart's home court. And note this French eclectic canopy over the door. And again, those French eclectic windows that run through the cornice line of the second story. By 1937, Basil Davis McCampbell, who was an attorney, and his wife, Catherine, also known as Kitty, who was the society editor for the newspaper, and their daughter, Carolyn, all lived in the house on Urban. It's interesting that in 1934, they lived on Joaquin Miller in the Little Stone Cottage next door to Greystone Castle. So the family had great taste in homes that they lived in. Sadly, Mr. Basil McCampbell died in May of 1937 of pneumonia at age 46. He was quite young, but Kitty was not one to grieve forever. She remarried a couple years later in 1939 to Ralph Brenninger, who was a professor of modern languages at the university. Uh, he then moved into the urban house. Uh, within the next few years, they sold to the Sligerland family. Here on the right side, we have the L.H. Arvin home. Uh, this is located at 80 Urban Circle, so kind of back to the old Northwest. And if you notice the year, it's 1953. So this is a very modern at the time ranch style design. It's a combination of clapboard and brick cladding. And of course, there's an attached garage, which was very much coming into vogue at the time. And then we have the Harold McNeil home here on the left, which DeLongchamp both designed and then later remodeled. The most interesting part of this design are the windows that wrap around the corner. And DeLongchamp and O'Brien did an addition, which might be this back porch that you can barely see here, or it could be a second story addition that's just not visible from the front of the house. We're not really sure. The design drawings were originally for a full two-story house, which obviously this house is not, but otherwise this house does match the design. And then on the right, we have the W.E. Brown House. And Mr. Brown was president of Flanagan's Warehouse. It's another American Foursquare style type of house with colonial revival elements. It has a box cornice, so these eaves are closed instead of open, what it means. 
Um, and then also an entry portico with double Tuscan columns. Originally, it also had multi-pane sash windows, which have since been replaced with um, vinyl sliders. And then we have the Thunderbird Lodge. So we'll wrap up. <laughs> it's still in Nevada, but a little bit west at Lake Tahoe. And this was designed for George Wattel, who was the rich and maybe slightly spoiled son of Mine Rush fortune people. George had the opportunity to buy 27 miles of shoreline on the Nevada side of Lake Tahoe. And so he bought it and he wanted to have a house built there and he did hired Mr. D to design it. However, he rejected more than two designs until he accepted this one, which is what was used. And you can see it's a beautiful stone masonry, kind of Tudor revival style. You've got a very dramatic, steep roof line. And it's said that the uh, rock workers who toiled on the Thunderbird Lodge were trained at the Stuart Indian School in Carson City. A lot of craftsmanship went into building those stone masonry walls. Before the pandemic, tours were offered here. They're well worth the time. I'm not sure if they've resumed yet, but when they do, we highly recommend a visit. And that concludes our presentation of Mr. DeLongchamp's designs in Washoe County. We want to wrap up with just a brief selection of his accomplishments over the years. So in 1915, fairly early on in his career, he designed Nevada's state building for the Panama Pacific Exposition that was held in San Francisco that year. This was during a time when world fairs were held all over the place, and this was just one of them. And the architects who were on the panel judging all the different buildings that were designed for the expo awarded Mr. DeLongchamp the silver medal for his design. And it's pictured up here at the top. A lot of these buildings were just constructed as temporary exhibit. So unfortunately, it no longer stands, but you can see it was just a gorgeous building. Uh, Mr. DeLongchamp also served as Nevada's only state architect during the years that the position existed, which uh, were from 1919 to 1921, and then again from 1923 to 1926. And so as state architect, he was responsible for official designing official state buildings, uh, not the least of which were some of the buildings constructed uh, at the Nevada State Prison in Carson City. He was also the first president of the Reno chapter of the American Institute of Architects uh, right after it was established in 1949. And then at the end of his career in 1966, at the University of Nevada, Reno recognized him officially as a distinguished Nevadan. So what is Mr. DeLongchamp's legacy? He designed hundreds of residential, commercial, and public buildings during his six-decade career. His buildings have shaped the built environment of Reno, Washoe County, um, but also of Nevada. He designed buildings all throughout our state. And his designs were functional, well-built, and beautiful. Um, they married solid engineering with artistry. And perhaps most remarkably, Mr. DeLongchamp practiced in a wide range of styles. We see Beaux-Arts, Art Deco, period revival, modernism. And he was really able to seamlessly adapt to the changing architectural styles during his nearly 60 years in practice, which is quite amazing. He never got stuck in a rut. He was always moving forward and always adapting to whatever the changing mode of architecture was. He was really an indispensable Nevada architect who made an indelible contribution to our state's landscape. And so we thank you so much for joining us for this presentation. And I also want to thank Anne for all her research and hard work. None of this would be possible without everything that she's done concerning Frederick DeLongchamp. So thanks, Anne.